So what fantastic uh, career stories from motorcycles to life in space mm -hmm. to lunar surface ops. It's truly exceptional. So before we get started, I really would like to encourage folks to ask questions through the app, but then also come up if you want to ask a, a question in person. There's microphones around the room. Um, but I'm going to start off with, you know, looking at all of your experiences. You have a very unique perspective, and so you have some a, you know, perspective on where the domain has been, but also where we're going. And there's a lot of exciting opportunities in human spaceflight, but there's also some landmines, right? That, that just is a byproduct of the ecosystem of human spaceflight. So could each of you talk about you know, what worries you, what keeps you up at night when we look at the future of human spaceflight? Tim, you wanna start? Yeah, I'll start. <clears throat> I guess um, you know, one thing to start out with is that um, and this is a uh, penchant for the obvious statement, but human spaceflight is really, really hazardous. Uh, and, uh, you know, the mention of Columbia, the Columbia accident really formed a whole group of managers in terms of how they look at, at human spaceflight. Like, we can't forget that lesson. Uh, and we're taking those kinds of lessons forward as we build Starlab. But, you know, what I think about every day with respect to that program is making sure that we build something that's safe and it's operational. The, the new thing that, um, that NASA is going towards, what NASA wants to do is transition, and you can back me up on this being a NASA person, <laughs> is transition low Earth orbit to the commercial domain so that NASA can really focus on Moon and Mars and going forward. And it'll always be a combination because the customer base is going to be NASA, ESA, commercial astronauts, maybe tourism but a, a variety pack. And so how do you balance the operational, technical, and economic uh, elements of a commercial space station? So like to answer your question very briefly, it's really about safety of the crew, uh, having lived through Columbia, but then also how do you do this in a way that's economically and um, business uh, viable? Um, yeah, I, so a lot of the things Tim said I agree with as well, but, um, I, you know, to me there's, there's, there's lots of things that are a little, a little challenging to, to worry about. Um, one is there's a lot going on all at the same time, right? We're trying to commercialize LEO, we're trying to essentially at the same time commercialize this lunar space. Um, and we're also like starting to dabble in, in more and more Mars missions. Um, so to me, what keeps me up is that e if even one failure, as Tim mentioned, even one failure takes a human life, that's certainly going to set back everything, mm -hmm. right? And, and there's a little bit of, uh, you know, in my mind, I kind of, I've watched, you know, again, like, as I said, I wasn't alive during the original Apollo missions, but if you rewind and you watch, uh, I, I'm, an, I'm a student of it, I've watched all of it, and, and I'll tell you, the, you know, the, the risk posture of NASA and the American people and the world was much more uh, ready to go after landing on the moon. And, and I think you know, the, the problem is at that point we just stopped. Once we had done enough of those missions, we proved we had advanced capabilities. The Cold War kind of was starting to fizzle out a little bit at that point. Um, and, and we stopped because the motivation was wrong. The motivation was, well, let's just flex our muscles and show that the United States can get there before the Soviet Union can get there. Mm -hmm. The reality is now this is not about nation versus nation conflict. It's about preserving humanity and exploring the universe, right? So to me, we, our risk tolerance has to go along with that. We have to be willing to accept we're going to lose some people, unfortunately. This is a very risky domain. Um, and uh, the people that board those vehicles know the risks as well. So. We're going to design every, every technology to be double, you know, to be single fault tolerant, double fault tolerant, protect against those failures. We're going to, have, we're going to instrument that every single system to make sure that we don't have those failures. But inevitably, at some point, there is going to be a failure. And it's going to be painful for all of us. But we have to work through it anyway. Mm -hmm. right? So that's, that is what keeps me up at night. Mm -hmm. um, 
but uh, we, we just have to accept our culture needs to change our, our risk tolerance. Okay. Jason, how about you? I'll say uh, it's, it's, it's the next generation. I, I want to say, like, keeping the next generation motivated uh, to want to go into this field. Um, it's, it's not easy. Um, obviously, STEM is, is not an easy field, and it can, and it can uh, uh, stress you out, challenge you, and make you frustrated, upset, right? But nothing, nothing worth its weight in gold is, is easy, right? Like, and so uh, I, I get nervous that um, we don't keep motivating folks like you all to, to keep pursuing this, this field. Uh, and, and, and then also, um, relative to that is just the diversity in the field too. Like, and I, and I don't mean, I do mean also what people look like and their backgrounds, but also diversity of thought too, right? Like, cause all, with that comes diversity of thought. Like people have different ways to think about problems based on their experiences. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that we, we keep everyone motivated to, to help us all be successful. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So let's take a question from the audience. I can barely see you over here from this podium, but <laughs> go ahead. Hi, I'm Alice Wade with the Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. And what I wanted to ask just for uh, all of you, I guess, is how do you see the future of both uh, private government uh, run space stations like the ISS and commercial space stations collaborating both in terms of technology, uh, you know, joint missions and things like that in the future? I, I got an easy answer. I see it like, uh, like how the U.S. Postal Service and, and FedEx and UPS, like all, mm -hmm. like there's enough for everybody. <laughs> I, I think um, we'll, we'll find a way to make sure that there's the right balance of, of government needs um, and the government will help support the commercial needs. Um, and then if, if it needs to, I'll say like flip where commercial is supporting the government needs, we'll, we'll figure it out. But I, I think there's gonna be plenty of, plenty of opportunities for, for them to co coexist. Maybe one thing to add is that, uh, you know, this is a new market. It's not like there's an existing market. It's not like, you know, cell phones where, you know, you, you can kind of predict, you know, what, how much you invest and what your return is going to be. And it, it's gonna be an evolution just like uh, through commercial cargo and commercial crew program, they weren't exactly commercial. If you look at commercial crew, 93% NASA funded, 7% uh, uh, commercially funded. So I think what you're gonna see as you transition into this, this commercial space station world for that element of it, is a transition to have more of a customer base that's beyond government, but it's gonna be a, a work in progress over time. Yeah. The, um the space station is the International Space Station is supposed to be deorbited in 2030. Um, NASA just announced that they're going to extend uh, the commercial resupply services missions to support that uh, station until that point. Uh, but in order to free up, I mean, running an International Space Station is a very high cost endeavor. And so in order to offset the funding required for Artemis, NASA is going to sunset the ISS and they're going to stand up, they're going to help stand up these you know, commercial destination free flyers, these commercial LEO space stations, right, across industry with supplemental funding from the industry itself, which is what's, what's happening right now. So uh, it's to, to me though, right now the problem is more about the transition versus the kind of sustaining both at the same time, yep. um, just because there's just not enough funding to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Okay, one more thing on that, and that is just to put it in perspective, right now for International Space Station, about $1.8 billion for operations and science, and about $1.3 billion for launching and resupply. Like, to make that next step, we have to figure out how to make that more economically viable. And we can do that through technology improvement of operations and taking those lessons learned from ISS. Yeah, so speaking of ISS, so Tim, in your talk, you mentioned, you know, a lot of the work that was done on ISS has been transitioned to the ground. So when we look at the future, how do you expect that to change when we look at lunar surface ops or uh, going to Mars with the extensive communication delays? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's a great question. You, you know, 
if you think about when uh, the space station uh, initial design was, if you go back to space station freedom, you look at the 1990s. So what was the state of the art back then? And so what the, the program has done over time is transition that, like robotics, for example, there wasn't trust in terms of uh, the technology to have that done with that sort of even short delay and not having visibility. So like what happens when you go to the lunar surface? Uh, you're not going to have the capacity for the ground to do a lot of those operations. So we need to incorporate machine learning, AI. We need to simplify design. And you know, um, Jason or John, I can't remember who had mentioned uh, the, the architectural art piece of it. Like the, the human factors, the ergonomics, have to be optimized in such a way that it makes it really, really simple, mm -hmm. as simple as you can. Space Station is not. I mean, the way it's designed, it's, uh, it's, it's not optimized for uh, minimizing operations. So we need to incorporate new technology and have really efficient designs to be effective on the moon. Yeah. So, um, you know, you all worked in little pieces of, of the International Space Station. And then when we talk about going back to the, the moon, it's really an international effort. So, you know, ISS has remained, you know, a vehicle for peace and for collaboration, and especially this community. This is an international community of young professionals. And so how can we ensure that things remain peaceful as we start expanding further out into the solar system? Uh, do you want to take it or do you want sure. me to? Go ahead, David. Say, I, I, <laughs> I, I think a lot of it boils down to us in the industry um, just collaborating for the, the benefit of space exploration and not, you know, being bothered by, I shouldn't say bothered, but bothered by, like, all the other political motivations that are out there, right? Like, I mean, space is always intended to be peaceful. I mean, even in this country, it's about one of the things that is about as bipartisan as you can get. Um, and we just need to keep that motivation going forward. I, yeah, I love the word you just used, Jason, about bi being bipartisan. I actually, I think of it the same way. That's the great thing about what we've reached now today is that we have bipartisan support domestically in the U.S. And, and that, is, that carries itself abroad as well. Uh, but the, the reality is that um, the relationship with, the U.S. relationship with Russia has, uh, been impacted over the last couple of years and um, and there's been a lot of rhetoric both ways um, with regards to the partnership on the International Space Station uh, I think that the best thing we can do to to mitigate that is to keep the channels of communication open keep the, the program where you know we send astronauts up on the Soyuz rocket going uh, we host astronauts on Dragon and Starliner, you know, we, we keep the relationship going. Uh, and, I, and I think maybe there's an opportunity to offer them some scope on, you know, upcoming Artemis work. But other than that, I think the communication lines have to stay open if you want to avoid conflict. Yeah. You know, the, uh, the way that we started working with the Russians was completely political. The, uh, and it was also relationship-based. So Jim Stafford and Alexei Leonov met each other on board uh, the shuttle Apollo, or the Apollo um, Soyuz mission. And they became best friends. I personally think that the reason we have this, this uh, relationship with Russia that's very effective in the space community is because two guys became really good friends. And from that, it turned into the shuttle Mir program, and then it turned into uh, us working closely with the Russians. So throughout the, for example, with the Russians, where, you know, in the international stage, it's a very tenuous relationship. In the space community, we still work closely with each other. So it really comes down to individuals working together. In this next stage, it's not, it's going to be both um, the political realm, but it's also going to be the economic realm. So we find ways to work with others because there's economic benefit for both. You know, you can look forward the, uh, the European Space Agency, but individual European countries, Nordic countries, Eastern European countries, as well as, as others. There's always going to be um, an element of politics involved that's going to either inhibit or restrict some of the work that we do with others. But the economic piece is actually going to be uh, a positive influence when it comes to human spaceflight. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's great examples about how you know space can be used as a diplomacy lever arm. So next, we're going to take a question from the audience. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Haley Daniel. Um, I was wondering, question for Jason. You talked about how you worked at various companies, various roles, but you still kept the dream alive of trying to be an astronaut. I was kind of curious, like, what helped you keep that dream alive despite everything you had to go through? Like, how did you find a way to, you know, make it into a positive situation? Uh, the, the anchor is space. I, I mean, at the end of the day, I realized I just love space and space exploration. And so even if I can't, like, be in it, I can be in it. Right. Like, and, and so knowing that there was still a way to, I guess, tangentially be a part of, you know, helping someone else get into space or helping um, others, you know, do their science missions, right? Like, I, I still felt, felt good about it. So. And I haven't given up yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Let's take another audience question. Go ahead. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Mike Isbell. I'm an accountant in semi-retirement. Um, I uh, have a question, I guess, about the future of low Earth orbit uh, space station activities, and that is, when are the commercial modules currently scheduled to be put into service alongside the ISS? 2028 is the target for us. Thank you very much. You bet. Just so you don't have to stand up there super long, you can go next. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Uh, my name is Alex Lemon with Johns Hopkins University, and my question's for all three of you. Um, so a lot of uh, flagship missions, for example, Artemis, you mentioned, get a lot of press coverage and a lot of attention. Um, but I've also seen a lot of publications, including from the Space Force, that there's a lot more interest, both from government and industry, um, for logistics, the sort of unsexier side of any industry, and all the supporting infrastructure behind that. Uh, can any or all three of you elaborate on efforts that you have either been a part of or that have witnessed uh, to develop sort of the supporting capabilities that can enable both existing and new kinds of missions? I think it's a good question. I don't have specific examples, but uh, having lived on board station, uh, knowing how important the uh, entire logistics chain is, I mean, things you don't think about. Because when you're on board station, what you have is what you have. The, the air you breathe, the ability to scrub out the carbon dioxide, the food you eat, the packaging for the food, how do you dispose of the waste? I mean, anything you do today, as you walk through your day today, think about what it would be like if you had to have it brought to you by a cargo vehicle. And then you extend that to the lunar surface, it's like a whole nother level. So the whole supply chain is super important. Uh, and like, it's a really finite level of detail. You know, for example, when the crew members do spacewalks, they have to have you know, a glove that goes underneath the primary spaceflight glove. And there's a special little thing that they use to clean off the visor. I mean, every little detail has to be thought of and planned out. So that's one of the reasons that it's such a challenging economic um, area for us to develop, because you need to be able to have that supply chain. Uh, and, and what happens, like any other industry, you end up developing that as you define the requirements and you identify the needs as you go forward. I'd say that, so I think the nature of your question was, can we talk to examples of logistics and things we know about that realm? So I, do I have that right? Yeah, also specifically things like uh, MEV, MRV, uh, for both the programs specifically. MEV, uh, MRV, I see. Okay, so yeah. Um, so to me, the, the actual logistics chain, there's, there's obviously lots of different customers we're talking about here, MRV and MEV uh, really are, uh, they're currently geared towards commercial opportunities, right? So we've done uh, the MEP, or I'm sorry, the MEV uh, that we docked with uh, a couple of Intel sats over the last couple of years. Um, it's kind of the, the start of what we call the on-orbit servicing uh, market. Um, you know, to me, that actually, it's that capability is a building block capability for uh, future uh, scenarios where the Lunar Gateway, for example, needs maintenance and you, you send a vehicle out there to go either inspect it or uh, refuel it or uh, repair something that's damaged, right? So we're a long way away, I think, from full autonomous repair of spacecraft on orbit, 
but we are certainly starting to make incremental design upgrades uh, to our capability set to get there. So uh, from a logistics perspective, that is a key uh, discriminator in the ability to sustain uh, capabilities at, you know, in deep space. Right? We need to be able to do that. We, we, we can't just rely on the life expectancy of the hardware on board the platform. We have to be able to swap out hardware, uh, have line replaceable unit type technologies. That's really critical to, to the, you know, to us being able to push deeper and, and deeper into space. Hey, one go back to so getting more insight into your question. Uh, for MRV and MEV, for example, as you know, it's really about making it economically viable. It's a trade-off case, like how much does it cost to launch? How much does it cost to repair it? Uh, and until we really hone some of that, that, um, that technology and those operations, it, it's going to be a balancing act. And it, what it does is, it, I, I think it extends out the timeline for some of the more challenging aspects of working in space, because it turns out it's really hard. And so, you know, if you can mitigate the, the risk of success of a particular mission by launching it versus maintaining it in space, then that's going to be the balance until we get to that level of technology. I As think. a very brief follow-up, uh, do you see the, the um, recent reduction in cost of launch services uh, basically making that calculus a bit more difficult for servicing, or no? I, the industry is attempting to standardize a lot of interfaces to essentially make it easier to service them on orbit. Um, so I think things are moving in a the right direction is the answer. Also, the, the launch costs, as launch availability and, and cost, well, launch availability increases and costs decrease right now. It, it plays into this trade of what it, you know, is it, is it cheaper to build another one and, and launch it, right? Or is it yeah. cheaper to, to resurface right. it? And so it's, it's, it's plays, it, it definitely plays its role in this balance of like yep. what's, what's economically viable. Right. Thank you very much for your time. Yep. So this next question is for uh, Jason. It was asked from Cesar from the audience. Thank you. So you talked about your time in the U.S. Senate, and you know we know that NASA is under the executive branch. Do you think working in space, going to the U.S. Senate, and then coming back into the space industry, has that really changed your perspective with your U.S. Senate background? <laughs> it did. Um, I, you, you go um, and uh, as a as a, as a cog in the wheel, right, mm -hmm. at, at NASA. I mean, I was, I was doing great stuff, but right, like you, you're highly focused on, on your little piece. Um, and then you go into the Senate and then you see everything that NASA's doing. I mean, aeronautics, which is like the, the lost little cousin of, of NASA that everybody forgets about. Like they do great stuff with aeronautics and te aeronaut uh, aeronautical technologies. Um, I was in human space flight, so I didn't see much about science uh, mission director too much, um, and so you, you see everything, and then you see the, the the delicate balance that the entire agency has to do um, relative to the pennies that they get, um, and it's 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 amazing to just see the inner workings from from the I guess even higher than NASA viewpoint of of what it takes to like make all of these things a success, all of the bartering and and. And uh, yeah, you know, uh, just uh, making things just kind of balance in a way that keeps everybody happy. Because the other thing I learned too was, um, as we all see, like no one's going to be happy with everything. Everybody's got their little pet project that they want to do, and um, and the NASA's got a, a tough job of trying to balance all that. And they do it amazingly. Like we we see on the surface, like like just the the beauty of everything, right? But like. Behind the scenes, there's a lot of great people at NASA, and even true in the Senate, that like figure all this stuff out and then give you all a product that you all get to clap and cheer for at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah thank you. So this question is from Becky from the audience. Uh, do you think that we are ready to become a multi-planetary species? Given how we've handled Earth, including global conflicts, there needs to be change to be successful. Do you think we're ready? So I'll, I'll take this one since I think it was geared towards me. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I, I, there was something I actually meant to say in my speech that I didn't, which was a lot of the 
the issues that we face on Earth today are actually the issues, the same issues that we'll face on the Moon and on Mars, which are really the, I, to me, one of the, one of the fundamental issues is to provide uh, the resources required to sustain human life, right? So, uh, food, water, shelter, um, and uh, and energy, uh, which all of which are not easy to come by um, unless you bring technology with you when you go settle on the surface of the moon or the surface of Mars. Uh, but that that's you know really the advantage. I think uh, there, there's there has been famine in the world. There has been there's been floods. There's been droughts. I mean, recently, like you look at California with the flooding. Uh, there's constant um, you know environmental effects that are impacting the earth, right? So we're learning from those things. We're trying to adapt to them. No, we'll never solve all of those problems, you know, completely in my mind. There's, there's a, that's just the nature of, of, of nature, right? Um, but we can certainly, we are building the technologies that we need to actually be able to, um, you know, grow food on Mars, you know, harvest water from the from the surface right harvest the energy uh, harvest materials for cryogenic propellants you know those those things are problems that we have on earth and i think by solving them for the human exploration missions we ha actually help earth um, and, th and that's that's a consistent um you know a s consistent benefit from from the space age the global space agencies that the amount of time and energy they invest into exploration actually helps us solve a lot of issues on Earth, right? So I think those things go hand in hand, parallel. I'll add, I think, um, I'll say the short answer is yes. And I think because we have to do it collaboratively, we have an opportunity to kind of, I'll say start fresh on a new planet, right? Like we can take our lessons learned from here and because we have to do it, We'll have to do it collaboratively. It'll help help us like extend beyond Earth. Mm -hmm. So uh, we only have a couple minutes left, but um, so a lot of the folks in the audience, they're students, they're young professionals, and so I want to talk a little bit more about what is one actionable tip or piece of advice that they could do today. I'm not talking five, 10 year development business plans. What can they do today in the short term to really prepare the future leaders that are in the audience for what's coming in the human space domain? I'll give a stab at one answer. I would recommend finding a mentor, like someone that uh, you really trust that has more experience. And they don't have to be like a gray beard. They could be someone just a few years more senior, but someone to bounce ideas off of, whether you stay in space or don't. Like the, I think the way our brains work, like we learn a lot when we verbalize things and we have someone that we trust that we can share with. It will give you lots of clarity in terms of the decisions that you make when you go forward. Great, thank you. I would say it's, it's be a student of everything. <laughs> Read constantly. Study politics, study the government, study, I, I mean, st study what it's going to be like to settle on Mars. Like, actually, like, th those, when you start to be a student of everything and everything interests you, that curiosity just drives you, you, you miss a lot less. And, and I, again, I really believe in breath. I believe that the more breath you have, the more powerful leader you'll be, ultimately. Um, so I, I, my recommendation, I, I love Tim's, which is to get a mentor, but, but I would say, you know, get yourself involved in lots of different things, lots of different functions, lots of different skill sets. Try things that make you uncomfortable because that's, I think, how you build the foundation that you need to be a really strong leader. I feel bad that I'm the only person with a gray beard. <laughs> Mine would start, it is starting to turn gray. My hair um, too. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll complete it with a, another uh, tidbit. I, I think communication is, is a valuable skill set. It's not a, a, an easy one, especially for folks in STEM. We, we know about the stereotypical engineer and all that stuff. It's just a stereotype. Break it. Get out, learn how to communicate, how to talk to people. Um, part of that is like getting with a mentor. Do 
like maybe semi-public speaking, like you don't have to be like a professional up here, or like I'm, I'm not, um, but like learn to communicate because because um, in order to be an effective leader, you need to be able to communicate. In order to be an effective engineer, computer scientist, whatever, you need to be able to communicate. You know, like it doesn't matter what great idea you have if you can't communicate it to someone. So. Mm -hmm. That's, that's my piece. Of that. That's great. Thank you so much. So that's about all the time we have today. Uh, thank you to our wonderful speakers for an engaging discussion. If we could give them a round of applause. <laughs>